Good morning. Was I precise enough for you, Tom? Okay. Isn't it nice to drive to church in the sunshine? Amen. What a privilege. What do you say we take a, a little bit of a minute or something like that to calm our spirits? Get ready to move a little closer to, to God. To be a little more receptive to his leading. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the privilege of gathering together here this morning to worship you, to praise you, to draw closer to you. And Father, we ask for the help of your Holy Spirit. Open our ears, our hearts, our eyes, our souls. To what it is that you want us to, to learn this morning. Help us, Father, to sing joyfully and praises to you. Help us, Father, to listen intently as Mark teaches the words from your word that you want us to hear this morning. Father, we are just so very grateful of the privilege that we have in worshiping you and following you, in loving you. And in Jesus' name we pray, Father. Amen. Amen. If we could all stand, we'll sing praise to the King.
be seated. Sorry. Parched. Grace, what have you done? Murdered for me on that cross. So wrong, sin washed away in your blood. Too much to make sense of it all. I know that your love breaks my fall. The scandal of grace, you died in my place. So Did you choose uh, Be Thou My Vision because it was so close St. Patrick's Day? <laughs> That's an old Irish hymn if you didn't know that. I, I knew that, but I got to tell you, that is, if I was going to choose a song to match the message, I probably would have chosen one. It's, it's, uh, it's going to fit real well. So um, He does that a lot. You know, I always kind of offer 
I want to offer to the music team say, you know, if you're having trouble choosing songs this week, call them. We'll, we'll theme up together, you know. But I never have to do that. God always works it out. And if you'll find, if you go home and what you're listening to on Christian radio will match the sermon. And something else you'll read this afternoon, you'll go, I think God's got something going today. I better pay attention. So, yeah. So he's talking about Ephesians today, by the way. Just so open your Bibles to Ephesians 1. And we're going to be in a different translation today. I've been preaching out of the New King James. Did you just bring your New King James just for the first time this week? Mark's been preaching out of the New King James. I usually use NIV. Or, so now I switch it up on you. Actually, there's a few translations I like, depending. I just like what the New American Standard says this morning. So if I pulled a fast one on you, just go. The text will be on the screen. or uh, Some of you are real good at looking at your Bibles, and I can keep track of where we're at. So. But as we work our way through the book of Ephesians, and we're going very slowly, we're still in chapter 1, but uh, I find this message pretty encouraging because no matter what comes our way in life, God's going to work it out. That's what I want to say. He makes it all come together. And whatever your plans were as a kid, what you thought you wanted to be when you grew up, or where you were going to live, I bet it's different now, right? In fact, I said, I would end it up here at this age, you know. Look at, look at Moses, okay? Moses was rescued out of the water as a baby, and uh, he should have been killed, but he was raised in royalty. And for 40 years, he could have thought, I'm here, God's placed me here, and he was aware of God. Uh, as a Hebrew, I'm, still, I'm placed in leadership in Egypt to protect my people. Well, and that didn't materialize. He ended up doing things the wrong way. He was a fugitive. And for another 40 years, until he was 80, he went out and he developed a family. And he, he was a shepherd in the backside of Midian until he saw a burning bush. And it was when he was 80 years old, he really started his ministry. So if you are in or around the age of 80, just know you're probably just now getting started for God, okay? It's supposed to be words of comfort, not a challenge. If you have your Bibles, would you read along with me? I want to read Ephesians 1, 7 through 12. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us in all, excuse me, which he lavished on us in all wisdom and insight. He made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his kind intention, which he purposed in him with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of the times. That is, the summing up of all things in Christ, things in the heavens and things on the earth. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will, to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory. Lord, as we look into your word today, may we learn more about you. May we learn more about what you have for us to do. And may you increase and we decrease. So speak to us and open our hearts as we open the word. In your name we pray, amen. Right where I stumbled on the reading there was a phrase that caught my eye as I was reading uh, to prepare for this message, and it's the word, the grace that he lavished on us. God has a master plan, and it includes his lavish grace. Now, when I prepare for a Sunday, what I usually do is I take the text I'm going to be going, and I read it several times, and I'll read it in several translations. And this caught my eye because of the word lavish. And I don't know what you think of lavish, but I think of a lot. Okay? And i got to confess, I think in the terms of food. Okay? So lavish or opulent or abundant. Uh, if you've ever been in a, a place where there's just tables covered with food and they got one of those chocolate fountains going and, and there's, you know, the fruit all looks beautiful and you're afraid even to go take a banana because you'll... It'll all collapse, but there's just, it's just lavish. Or that Christmas tree where there's just a mountain of presents. It actually goes up the back wall, and, and everything about that Christmas morning is, is lavish and, and exorbitant. and It just goes on and on and on. 
That's what God's grace is. Have you ever been in a situation where we don't think of God's grace as lavish? Maybe you were raised in in an environment where you had to make every dollar count or you didn't have a a long way to stretch uh, your income. So the idea of, of lavish and overflowing just wasn't there. So we look at God's grace as here's a little bit of grace and then here's a little bit of grace. And as, as, you, as you use that up, we'll, we'll give you a little more. But you think of God's grace like that, I kind of have to use it wisely or, or God's going to snatch it from you. Ephesians here says something different. God gives lavish grace. And here's the thing about it. It makes a huge change in your life. It is overwhelming. You are unable not to notice it. Picture those days where it's cloudy and all of a sudden you think, is it starting to rain? And you kind of look and, yeah, I I think I see a few dots. That kind of moisture hitting you or somebody sneaking up behind you with a Gatorade cooler and you get ice watered. One's a little bit more than the other. When you meet Jesus, that's what it's like. Now, don't misread me here because some of you may have been like me um, I was kind of young, or maybe the circumstances of you coming to Christ were a way that there wasn't a dramatic, sudden change. I was saved as a young kid. I think I shared my testimony the first Sunday I ever talked here. But some of those details, it's been far enough, it, it's dim. And I always kind of wanted to be one of those guys that you'd always hear their testimony. They were saved much later in life, and, uh, you know, they, after sniping for the U.S. Army in Vietnam. They joined a biker gang, and they had this real dramatic sin period, you know, that God dramatically saved them out of. They knew exactly the date and the time and what they were wearing and everything about their salvation experience. And God was very dramatic to them, and I always wanted that because God's always been in my life. So don't mistake the fact of lavish grace and the overflowing, startling effect of Christ being part of your life as something that was sudden and dramatic, because maybe that isn't your story. That's okay. But is Jesus that important to you? That's what we're looking for. If he's not very important to you, I mean, you're here, so he's obviously got an importance. There's a lot of things that you could do this morning rather than be here. So I I think we're on the same page. But how much has Christ had an effect in your life? How much does his grace come upon you? As I read here, he says, he lavished his grace on us and he redeemed us, literally out of slavery. So as the text mentions slavery, what it talks about is, you got to picture somebody standing on the the auction block as slaves. And this is very crude, and, and I don't mean to be overly blunt here, but you can picture somebody in chains, enslaved. And your former master is now, you've been used by your former master and you're now going to be sold. And what can you expect? To be sold back into slavery. I've been a slave, I'm always gonna be a slave. I just, I can only hope my new situation is not quite as painful as my old one. But what are you? You're a slave. And the new situation is this. Somebody buys you. They literally redeem you. They pay your price. We have a new relationship with God at this point. And, and, you know, we're very aware of it because we're more than just purchased slaves. How does God want us to view him, by the way? Now, if you grew up in cattle country, I grew up in where there was cattle And uh, some of you may have experience around a livestock auction where there's a lot of livestock. And you might have bought an animal or been around one. Maybe you grew up on a farm and and you raised pigs or sheep or or cattle. And you can kind of, they can become pets, can't they? I had a grandfather that would raise animals and invariably he'd name them. That's always a no-no. Okay, don't do that. He was actually my other grandpa he knew well, and he would say, Jack, I got two hogs that uh, their names are, you know, 
Peter and Petunia or something, and, and uh, well, we, we just can't eat them now. And my other grandpa would say, yeah, well, I have this calf we raised, Oscar, you know. And invariably, they were switching animals because they'd grown affection. When you buy an animal like that, you might become very affectionate to it. But the purpose is you're going to eat it. Did God purchase us for his advantage like that? Let's not be quite that crass. Let's, let's look at it. Maybe God purchased us and is going to treat us as employees. That's better than slavery, right? He's going to use us, and he's going to kind of compensate us with eternal life someday, and maybe throw some blessing our way now, but we're going to earn that from him. Is that what their relationship with God should be? No. Maybe God just wants to hold me, like I said, as a pet, or, or worse, as a toy, a big doll. And God takes and has, enjoys me and then puts me on the shelf, and I'm, I'm just there for him. The new relationship I have with God is not any of those. It says we are his children. So imagine being a purchased slave again, and you go with your new master, and the chains come off. And he says, here's what I'm going to call you. Here's where you'll live. I'm going to call you son, and you can address me as father. In fact, you can address me as Abba, father. We'll get to that in a bit. And you go, really? But am I just sort of, is this for a legal purpose? No, I'm actually going to make you my heir. You're going to inherit from me one day, just like my firstborn. That's where God's got us. That's the relationship he offers us with him. Now, here's why. For his purposes. We covered that pretty extensively last week. But he says that here. Uh, let me read it again. In verse 10, with a view to an administration suitable to the fullness of times, that is, the summing up of all things in Christ. His way, in his time, going to sum up all things for God's glory, all things in Christ. He's going to bring it to completion. Isn't that great? I love that phrase, fullness of time. If you read the Christmas story, for instance, you're going to, it uses that. The Gospels will talk about in the fullness of time, what happened? God got Mary and Joseph and the Magi and the shepherds and everybody together, and he brought about Christ's first advent. Messiah came. Not too early, not too late, just in the fullness of time. And throughout Jesus' life here, it says that uh, he would be talking and he would do some miracles and somebody would get upset with him. And they even tried to arrest him sometimes. They even tried to kill him sometimes. In his hometown, they were going to throw him off a cliff. And he just walked away. How did he get away? Well, the Bible says it wasn't his time. In the fullness of time, when the time was right, God did some things. Now, the concept of time with God sometimes we struggle with. We sang a hymn when I was growing up called uh, When the Roll is Called Up Yonder. I know you guys might be familiar with that. It starts off and it says, When the trumpet of the Lord will sound and time will be no more. Well, I know what they mean. Time's not going to matter. And it, certainly God flows through time more, better than we do. We might say God's outside of time. You know, he experiences time different than we do. He's not bound by time. But to say there's no more time is, is not quite accurate because then there's no duration, you see. And so obviously if there's eternity, duration is going to happen. So in that sense, time happens. But God is very aware of the times. And he brings things about in the fullness of time. So at the right time, he had Jesus be born. In the right time, he had him become a rabbi. In that culture, you had to be 30 years old to be a respectable rabbi. In the fullness of time, three years later, he sent Jesus to the cross. Well, now we've got to submit to his time schedule. If I was de designing that, I can see waiting until he's 30, but I wouldn't have limited Jesus' ministry to three years, would you? How many more people could he have helped? What if he'd have gone 10 years and died when he was 40? It would have been better, right? 
why not do a Moses and when he's 80? We're to really ramp up Messiah's ministry. Because in the fullness of time, three years was just right. What happens is we come to find out that God's timing might be different than my timing. And God's plans are different than my plans because in the fullness of time, he's doing things just right. So we sing a song like, Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of My Heart. And then the verse we didn't sing, Oh wait, Lord, your vision is the wrong time. <laughs> that verse isn't there. It's probably in the other Irish hymn. You know? yes. you know. That's right. But God's heavenly perspective is what we want to see. We want that vision to be there. And his vision says, I'm not just calling you as employees or toys or livestock or slaves. I'm calling you as children. In fact, I'm calling you to be my heirs. And I'm going to accomplish this, I assure you, my way and my time. Is this something that we can, we can handle? Is, I mean, I know it, and yet I don't always believe it in here. Because we can say it's true, and then, but God, you're doing this one wrong. I mean, we'd never say it like that out loud. I could probably say that to Cindy, and she'd know I was just frustrated, but... I can't say it to you, although I think I just did. But. <laughs> what happens when everything seems to be going right and everything seems to go so wrong? Does God really know what he's doing? We know he does, but we just bump up against that so much. Turn clear back to the book of 2 Kings. That's back in the Old Testament. And you'll find those books, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. And I want to be in 2 Kings chapter 5, and we're going to meet a man named Naaman. Now, you may know his story. If not, you're going to hear it for the first time here. Naaman is not a guy from Israel. In fact, he's from almost the enemies of Israel. He lives in a place called Syria, or is, uh, it's also called Aram, A-R-A-M. So he's an Aramaic individual. So if I refer to him as Aramaic or Syrian, you just forgive me, I'm going to bounce back and forth. Some of your Bibles are going to call it Syria, some are going to call it Aram. But let's meet him in chapter 5, and let's read the first eight verses here. Now Naaman, captain of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man with his master, and highly respected, because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. The man also was a valiant warrior, but here's five words that'll get you. But he was a leper. Now, his master is the king of Aram. That's his master. However, Naaman happens to be probably the most powerful man in the kingdom of Aram. They're a great nation now because of him. Verse 2, now the Assyrians, excuse me, now the Amari, excuse the Amari, let's start this over. <laughs> now the Arameans, had gone out in bands and had taken captive a little girl from the land of Israel, and she waited on Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, I wish that my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria. Then he would cure him of his leprosy. They used to do these little raiding parties. Even though they were technically at peace with Israel, it was a tentative peace, and they didn't like each other. It was just going to be too expensive to go to war. But some people still went to the south and they raided the northern tribes of Israel. And this little girl had been captured and now was, yes, a slave. And she had a pretty cushy job. But she would have been very young. It says little girl, so she's probably between 5 and 10 years old. So picture some of our kids back here now living as a servant, even though a servant to one of the richest people in the country. Verse 4, it says, Naaman went in and told his master, that's the king, saying, Thus and thus spoke the girl who was from the land of Israel. Then the king of Aram said, Go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. He departed and took with him ten talents of silver and six thousand shekels of gold and ten changes of clothes. He brought the letter to the king of Israel, saying, And now... 
As this letter comes to you, behold, I have sent Naaman my servant to you, that you may cure him of his leprosy. So he goes on, on kind of a diplomatic mission. He comes with all this wealth. Yes, clothes had some wealth there. I mean, we look at somebody with their driving, and we go, wow, that guy can drive a Bentley? Okay, we don't think he's, we, we immediately make a judgment about him. They did that with clothes. In fact, I was teaching a class one time of, of fourth graders, and I had to explain this, and I said, clothes were your wealth. In fact, you could inherit the clothes from your parents and grandparents when they died. And one of my fourth graders went, oh, gross. <laughs> I'm thinking, you should be honored to get my clothes. You know. <laughs> Verse 7. When the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his clothes, more about that, and said, am I God to kill and to make alive that this man is sending word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? But consider now and see how he's seeking a quarrel against me. So he thinks it's all a ploy to, to pick a fight. And you did that when you were grieved. You tore your clothes. I, I guess he's got a Bruce Bannon going on, like the Hulk, and he just... You know, look at your closet. It's all ripped out. I've been having a lot of bad days. You know, so. In verse 8, it happened when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent word to the king, saying, Why have you torn your clothes? Now let him come to me, and he shall know that there's a prophet in Israel. So here's Naaman, and he's got a tragic situation. Now, he's going to go from hopeless to whole. We're going to hear how he's healed. But everything's going right for him. He had it all. He really did. He had fame. He had notoriety. God had used him to make his kingdom one of the greatest in that region. And through strength, he'd brought about peace with all his other enemies. And the king needed him. In fact, if Naaman couldn't lead the army, the nation was at risk. So he's literally too big to fail. We use that phrase sometimes. This institution or this organization is too big to fail. That's Naaman. The king has a very critical interest in Naaman being healed. So I don't know if you understand what leprosy is like, a skin condition, and it becomes then a, a flesh condition. We read about it in the scriptures. If you've done any stuff, any research on it, you realize how tragic this was. Um, we have several people in our congregation here that battle things like cancer, that battle other things, severe diseases. In this day and age, this would be worse because the idea of being unclean you couldn't just something that you would get sympathy for. This affected your standing with all of your people. What's he going to do? Well, his only hope is kind of desperate. And imagine you, a little girl that's from kind of your enemy says, Oh, if you could meet the prophet that lives in my hometown, um, he could cure you of your leprosy. And so you go to the king and you say, I, I might have a plan. Y yeah, what is it? Well, I was talking to a little girl. Yeah. And she said if I went and talked to a Hebrew prophet, that he might be able to heal me. That's it? That's all I got. So he's got this desperate plan. I'll tell you what, I'll write a letter. You take a bunch of stuff down there. I mean... That's all we got. And literally the fate of his nation is resting upon him being healed. So what's his path to health he's got? Well, he goes down, he's presented to the king. King thinks it's all a ploy. Elisha hears about it. Send him to me. I'll take care of this. That takes it out of the king of Israel's hands, and now Naaman has to deal with that. Let's pick up where we left off, verse 9. So Naaman came with his horses and his chariots, and he stood at the doorway of the house of Elisha. So here he comes, and, and his, his horses and his chariots, by the way, that's a, that's a battle vehicle. You show up with horses and chariots, it's like showing up with what? Your vehicles and your tanks. 
okay? So what's the hidden message here? Um, I'm here for you to fix my leprosy. Do you know who I am? Do you know who I represent? Verse 10. Elisha sent a messenger to him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and your flesh will be restored to you, and you will be clean. What a, what a slam. So the butler comes out, I guess, I don't know, a servant. Yes, nice tanks, what do you want? I'm Naaman, and I need to be cured. I've got a lot of wealth if you do it. I've got a lot of tanks if you don't. So what does the butler say? One moment. We'll see the look on this prophet's face when he sees all this. Well, the butler appears again. He says, he's busy right now, but uh, he did give me a message. Um, go down to the river down here and dunk yourself seven times. He's not going to come out and tell me himself? No, nope. no, nope, that's it. Yeah. And, and then you will be clean. Look at what happens in verse 11. But Naaman was furious and went away and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God and wave his hand over the place and cure the leper. Are not Arbana, Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? I mean, if I got to get wet, the Jordan's muddy and it's got the moss floating in it. and I've got nicer rivers than this at home if I'm going to take a bath. Could I not wash them and be clean? So he turned away and went away in us in a rage. You ever been like that? This isn't what I expected. Then his servants, oh, wise men, came near and spoke to him and said, My father, had the prophet told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he says to you, wash and be clean? So he went down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the word of the man of God. And his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Wow. I don't know what he was expecting. Well, he says what he was expecting. I, I thought he'd come out and there'd be some drama and I could see it happening. I don't know. I'm picturing it on his arms, and I'll explain why in a little bit. But that's where we can kind of look and go, was he going to fix this or what? Well, he says, go bathe in the river. I can bathe elsewhere. Come on, take a bath. You're crazy. What if he asked you to do something hard? What if he said, I want you to go on a quest and, and capture this artifact and bring it to me? What if he said, go out and slay dragons or, or whatever? You do something difficult. Did you do something easy? I was reminded of this uh, once I heard somebody say she was so mad at her son. She says, I'm never going to speak to him again. Why? The way he treated me, I'm done. I'm done ever talking to him. And he had treated her rotten. After a while, I said, I think all of us hope we would die for our kids and our grand. Would you give your life for your kids? Oh, I like to think I would, yeah, absolutely. That's a difficult thing. Would you do less than die for your kids? What if you just had to get, you know, a broken ankle for your kids or something? What if you just had to put up with them being mean? Maybe he's having a bad day and he didn't, maybe he feels terrible about what he said. Would you die for your kids? Would you do less than die for your kids? If he'd asked you to do something difficult, you'd do it. How about when he asks you to do something easy? Why is it so hard to do easy things when God wants us to do something that we're not expecting? I don't know. What it is, I think we, we like to think we give ourselves a better grade there. than If I won't even do the easy thing, I probably wouldn't do the hard thing either. So he goes in. And it probably was humiliating, so I don't know. He gets on his suit, and I'm picturing the shower cap and little pinchy thing on his nose, and maybe the life preserver with little... Horsey on the front. The Bible doesn't say any of that. But he's humiliated, okay? And in front of all his people, he's got to stomp down the river. And can you picture this? How does he go under? Does he, does he dive under? Does he, 
fold his nose and go under and come up. It looks the same. Two, three. I don't think it's working. He said seven. Okay. He gets through six, and finally seven, he comes up. And he's clean. (laughs) He's clean. I can remember reading this years ago, and Cindy was babysitting a little guy. He wasn't even two, was he, at that point? And he used to take his afternoon nap. I'd hold him in the chair, and he'd fall asleep. And I can remember looking down at his little arm. Mason's little arm was so smooth like a kid's. And here's my old man arm with the hair and the spots. And I remember thinking, Naaman should have at least got age-appropriate skin back. I can see healing him, <laughs> but the skin, is what does it say? His flesh was like the flesh of a little child. Well, I mean, grace is grace, right? No, it's lavish grace. And here's why. He's literally born again at this point. His life changed. When he comes up out of that water after seven times and he is clean, we're going to see a new dramatic effect happen to Naaman. Verse 15. When he returned to the man of God with all his company and came and stood before him, he said, Behold, now I know there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Now, he'd lived in a society where there was idols and there was many gods, and I don't know what he believed about them, but he believes in one God now. So please take a present from your servant now. But he said, as the Lord lives, before whom I, this is Elisha talking now, as the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will take nothing. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. You see, that's the thing about grace. We might be so overwhelmed by it, we think somehow we got to pay for it. I understand the desire to serve God and give something back because we've been so dramatically changed. When we understand what we're saved from, we do want to serve But the fact is, is we are never going to pay God back. Oh, I get like that sometimes. I figure I said a bad word, so God gives me a flat tire, right? Or I'm having a bad day, and I was angry, so now I better, what? I better give an extra offering. Give whatever you want, but you're not paying back God's grace, I'm just telling you. And Elisha says that here dramatically. I'm not going to accept anything from you. God healed you, not me. And it wasn't my power of God that did this to you. God decided to do this for you, so you serve him. Now, Naaman then says something kind of odd. Verse 17, Naaman said, If not, please let your servant at least be given two mules load of earth, for your servant will no longer offer burnt offering, nor will he sacrifice to other gods but to the Lord. You see, in that culture it was decided that uh, you needed to worship God at his place. And so he says, I need two mules worth of dirt. And I don't know what he was going to do at his house if he was going to have a dirt pile. And that's where we worship God. That's where we're going to have an altar. And if I'm going to worship the one true God, I'm going to worship on his dirt or on his terms, let's just call it. And then he thinks of something. And maybe when you've met God, you've, you've done this too. You thought, wow, God's grace is amazing, and yet I still have issues, and I can still think of ways that maybe God's not going to want me after all. Maybe I've met this great God, and he's made me clean, and I still have something I can't figure out. So he says this, verse 18. In this matter, he thought of something. May the Lord pardon your servant. He's talking about himself here. When my master, the king, goes into the house of Rimmon to worship. Now, Rimmon's the god of Aram, of Syria, when he goes into the house of Rimmon to worship there, and he leans on my hand, and I bow myself in the house of Rimmon. When I bow myself in the house of Rimmon, the Lord pardon your servant in this matter. See, sometimes I got to go into the other temple, and I don't want to worship there, but I have to because it's my job. And, and when the king bows down, he, and, you know, he's got bad knees, and so I kind of have to bow down and I'm not worshiping. I don't mean that, but what do I do? 
You hear the words? And he said to him, this is Elisha says to him, go in peace. You know what? God's grace continues. So he departed from him some distance. When we see God's bigger picture, when we have his vision and his perspective, we realize who God is. Now I'm not going to worship anybody but the God of Israel. Oh, I had a lot of other things on my plate, and I thought of the world in a lot of different ways, but now I've been cleaned. And this is how I'm going to view things now. I'm going to worship God on his terms. But I still have things in my life that I need God's grace for. I mean, every day. And in fact, my very job and the relationships I have back home are going to require me to be in situations where my faith's going to be challenged. Do any of you live like that? I think all of us do. We work around people that have salty talk, and we don't want to talk that way. We have family members that we say, it will be an act of God if they understand God's grace. But meanwhile, i got to spend Christmas and Thanksgiving and Easter with them. And we all know that dynamic, right? We love where we live, and yet sometimes we hate the way it's governed. God, I need your grace every day because every time these situations come up and I don't know how to handle them, you know what he says? I do. In the fullness of time, I'm going to handle stuff, so go in peace. So we have all kinds of question marks, and we're going to leave church today, and we're going to say, I never really got answers on exactly what I was supposed to do, but God knows what to do, so I'm going to go in peace. And we started this whole study of Ephesians understanding God's peace. How does God do that? Because of the relationship we have with him. I want to conclude in Romans, my favorite passages. For one, Romans 8.1 might very well be one of my favorite verse. Romans 8.1 says, For there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is therefore now no condemnation. Not someday when we get to heaven. I'm saying God's grace makes us stand before him as righteous. Now let's jump down to verse 12. That's where we're going to start reading today. Romans 8.12. So then, brethren... We are under obligation not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. Live according to the flesh, then that's, that's all I'm obsessed with. What I'm going to eat, what I'm going to drink, how things are going to go, how do I feel in this life, in the few decades I have here. I'm not going to live according to that. He says in verse 13, but if you're living according to the flesh, you must die. And that's all you do is you live until you die. And so we come out with the phrase, Welcome to the human race. And that's the race that none of us end up winning. We all lose that one. That's living according to the flesh. But if I'm going to live according to the spirit, that's God's spirit. For if you're living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. For you have not received the spirit of slavery again, to fear, leading to fear again. And let me just point this out. You'll notice the capital S and the small s on these. Capital S is the Holy Spirit. Small s is our spirit, our soul. And sometimes it's even talking again here like an attitude. So that's the disadvantage of English. Okay. There's many advantages to the English language. There's many disadvantages to the English language. You just saw a disadvantage here. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you have received a spirit of adoption as sons, which we cry out, Abba, Father. These are terms of affection. Abba is the Hebrew word for Papa or Daddy. It's, I think I heard Elton say that uh, once. He's, he's very fond of that phrase. My grandkids call me Baba um, because their other grandpa, that's one of the things when you become a grandparent, you get to choose your grandpa name. You know, I could be grandpa, but the great grandpa is one of the name grandpa. So uh, the other grandpa chose Papa. So I saw Hebrew kids call me, except my one granddaughter shortened it to Bob. 
Bob. She looks at me and says, Bob? Oh, sorry to make you waste syllables there, kid, you know. But. The thing is, I love being, and in fact, that's my, my screen name now, Spiff Baba, you know. Um, I guess I can tell, I'm embarrassed about my middle name, it's Stanley. Okay. It's not embarrassing, but it was to me for some reason, I was a kid. And so, my kids said, does Baba have a middle name? They're, at, they're finding out his name. Yeah, he has, does he have a middle name? Yeah, it's Stanley. My grandson says, his parents named him Baba Stanley? <laughs> well, Bob Stanley, I guess. So. Let's go on. It says here, we cry out, Abba, Father. We have a relationship with him. And it's on that basis that he wants us to live by his spirit. Verse 16, the spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we're children of God. We know we have a relationship with him, spirit to spirit. When we know Christ, we can tell there's a relationship and a love relationship there. And if children, then heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. Now, if you memorize scripture, and I encourage you to, this is one to do. Verse 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. What are you going through? And some of the suffering here is, is persecution, but it also includes all suffering. Your suffering you go through now is not worth comparing with what's going to come. God's going to bring everything to completion. And that means we no longer have that short-sighted, worldly, fleshly vision what was Naaman concerned with? Getting over my leprosy. What was the king concerned with? Not having a war. What was God concerned with? Capturing Naaman's heart and showing him who the true God was. That's the vision we're supposed to have. Otherwise, it would have still end in death. It might have delayed death, but living by the Spirit brings life. We're not enslaved anymore with that limited perspective. I don't know everybody's story here yet, how you met Jesus. In fact, I don't even know if everybody here has met Jesus. But I tell you this, you don't meet Jesus by doing great deeds. You don't meet Jesus the way you expect. You meet Jesus by trusting in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. He died a sacrifice for our sins. He had no sin. And our sin disqualified us from ever knowing God but we trust him and say his death on my behalf. That's God's grace. That's the good news. That's why it's so overwhelming. I'm going to live by the spirit and not by the flesh. And what that boils down to is this. I'm not struggling with sin like I did before. I'm not just always giving into it. And I'm not looking only at this life. I can look beyond this life. How dear it is when you have a saint that's lived and they realize the heaven that's coming is so much more. About five years ago, um, I'm gonna say we had the privilege of seeing Cindy's father pass into glory. And it was, it was tough. Because it took him a while in bed. And he was not well for a long time. But as far as I know, his last words are, Thank you, Lord, for all the blessings you've given me. And what a legacy that man left. And if I can be even a little bit like Joe Peterson, I'll count myself a success. His perspective looked forward to heaven. This life was just getting to know God. It's where he met Jesus. I don't know how old he would be. He was, uh, birthday was December 7th. I can tell you guys this, probably didn't get to tell us on camera, but his initials were J-A-P. December 7th. You do the story. However, <laughs> you know, he lives on. 
we don't describe it as December 7th would be his birthday. Joe would be this old today. We say, today is dad's birthday. And today he is this old. Because time goes on. In the fullness of time, he's now met the fullness of time. I get off track here a little bit. We're not slaves to fear or to sin or to death. We're no longer afraid of those things. We're no longer afraid to suffer. You see what it said? If you suffer as his child, that's not a measure of how much he loves you. Do you ever do that? I do. I still do that. Even little things. Got your arms full and you go to open the door and it shuts instead. And what do I say? Really? Is this how we're going to do this? Who am I talking to? I guess I'm talking to God. Like he has to explain that to me. And yeah, Mark, that's how we're doing this. I'm not going to set this down and I got no place to set it. Cindy, hold this, you know. No. No, I, I, you don't live like that. that. That's not even suffering. The thing is, is he doesn't measure his love for us based upon our performance. He loves us because he chose to. And he says, if you suffer with him, you're going to be glorified with him. I used to take passages like this and say, now in America, we're not really persecuted, are we? But I'll say as of this year, folks were persecuted. As God's people, Christians are going to jail. They're losing their jobs. In America, we're not seeing the physical beatings going on, but we are elsewhere in the world. But I'll say this, even now in what we would call the land of the free, home of the brave, God's people are experiencing persecution. If you suffer that, that's not a measure of God's love. He doesn't allow you to be persecuted because you need a lesson. He himself died for you. And so Paul writes here and he says, that means God has a special place for you. If you suffered with him, you're going to be glorified with him. And then there's that wonderful theme verse, because nothing compares to the glory that we're going to see in him someday. For I consider that the sufferings of the present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. Yeah. Be my vision, Lord. Be thou my vision. What else have we got? May he bring it all to completion for us. Let's pray. Lord, like Naaman, sometimes we have an idea of this life. And we struggle to, to cure our ills, and overcome the things that bother us. And some of them are life-threatening. Some are just annoying. We're afraid of how we'll appear. Let us recall what it was like when we met Jesus. Let us notice how much you've made us clean. And it's for your glory. And it's not something we can pay back. Lord, may you bring us to completion. May we live for you. And if we are called to die for you, may we do that well. Because what's coming is glorious. Thank you for your word and let it be held in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we want to take some time for prayer this morning and before we do our missions report. And I um, want to get prayer requests.